thank you first of all for inviting me it's it's very nice to uh, be invited to do things um i'm daniela i work at divio um and most of you i think know me but um there are my contact details if you want to uh get in touch but i'll be trying to hang around during the sprint um as well um divio we have a uh, a cloud hosting platform it's built in in Django and um, I'm very happy to talk to you about that anybody who'd like to talk about that but since you probably know about me and about Divio already I'll save that for another time um, now uh, probably unusually I need to give you a, um, a Moses warning uh, at the start of this um, talk you don't normally have those in, in, in talks um, the reason is that the way I talk about this stuff is as if I'd been handed some tablets on, on the mountain and were coming down with them. And it's not really like that. What I'm going to present is a framework that's intended to make your life easier rather than some uh, prescription for your life. So um, you can take the tone with a little bit of a, a pinch of salt. It's just that when I get invited to speak, then I just take advantage of it. So you'll have to excuse that. Anyway, my uh, proposition is th about technical documentation is that it isn't just one thing, it's for different things, even though we speak of it as if it were monolithic. And um, the way we talk about documentation as one thing has the effect of concealing its, um, its nature from us. So these are the fundamental four things that documentation uh, is composed of. Um, you can, the names actually are less important than uh, what they really are, but they are tutorials, how-to guides, reference material, and explanation. And um, I'm not really sure if they're types or components or, or forms, or I think maybe they're, they're modes of uh, documentation, but they represent four different, um, completely different objectives and functions. And if you're producing documentation, a documentation set for a product or a project, then it needs to contain each of these, and the documentation should be structured according to this scheme and each of these modes or forms has its own distinct style of writing it has its own purpose it answers different needs um, and should be kept separate and distinct from the others and I believe it's the key to making documentation easier uh, to maintain and uh, to use as, as a reader so we'll start with um, tutorials so a tutorial is a lesson that takes the reader by the hand through a series of practical steps to complete some meaningful project or exercise. So if you think about a lesson, a lesson is an experience, a pedagogical experience. And I'm using analogies of uh, the kitchen in, in this um, uh, presentation. So maybe you've taught a small child to cook. Perhaps that's an experience you're already familiar with. If you've done that, you'll have a good sense of what kind of thing works and what kind of thing really doesn't. So if in your first lesson with a small child, you start explaining the chemistry of proteins, you're just going to end up with a small child in tears after a while. It doesn't work. So the docu um, tutorials in documentation must answer uh, must understand questions like how does one learn a new skill? What kind of experience does one have when one is learning? And the answer is that the only way that somebody learns a skill is by doing things. And a successful tutorial has to put this into um, practice. So a tutorial is um, a learning experience. Tutorials are learning oriented. And your task in when you create a tutorial is not to teach, but to, to create a learning experience. And a learning experience is an experience in which a pupil learns by doing things under your direction. So your job in the tutorial is to get somebody to do something. And that thing that you get them to do has to be repeatable. They must be able to come back and do it again. It has to give them confidence um, so that they believe in themselves, they believe in you, they believe in the product. 
it has to result in success every single time for every learner. And that's one of the hardest things to achieve, especially since in a tutorial, you're not there to help them when things go wrong. And it has to be concrete and particular. This is very, these are very difficult things for, for people working in, in um, uh, programming because abstraction, explanation, choices, they are the bread and butter of programming. Programmers love those things because that's how they, they, they grasp the world. But they don't belong in, tutor in tutorials that are kind of anti-pedagogical pollution that will um, spoil a tutorial. So the only thing that you should be caring about in your tutorial is what is your pupil going to do in order that they learn from the experience. And tutorials, they are in universally the least well understood part of documentation. They're the most difficult part to write, to maintain, and they're always the most badly written part of um, documentation. So that's not the fault of anybody who's writing documentation. Um, it's a fact that a lesson in the form of a tutorial, a written tutorial, is always going to be suboptimal because you're in the position of being responsible for somebody's success, responsible for, learn for their learning, responsible for providing an experience that will instill confidence. And at the same time, you're condemned to be absent because you're not, you can't be there with them. And if you think that sounds a little bit unfair, then I think you're probably, um, you're probably right. Um, but you have to understand that that's the situation that you have to deal with. So when I'm working on documentation, tutorials can spend, can occupy something like 80% of the time that it takes me and certainly something like 99% of the difficulty that it involves. They're, they're the, by far the hardest part to get right. Um, okay, um, let's move on to how-to guides. So how-to guides, they um, take the reader through the steps required to some, to, to, through the steps required to complete some specific task or solve some particular problem. And they are recipes. And you can think about the recipe for preparing some dish. What, what's the function of a recipe? What form does it take? What would you expect to find in a recipe? What would you consider out of place? Um, they're much easier to deal with than tutorials, far easier. So they're task oriented, problem oriented, same thing. Um, a kitchen recipe is actually a really good guide because a recipe uh, has a practical purpose. It serves some practical function. It moves towards a clear objective to obtain a well-defined result. Um, now, um, how to guide is unlike a tutorial in that it can only serve a user who already has some competence. No child learnt cooking by reading uh, a recipe book. So unlike the tutorial, it doesn't have any obligation to the needs of, of the learner. And it has, so its purpose, its audience, its style are different from those of the tutorial. Um, the language is always needs to be imperative. So, you know, if you want to do this, then you need to do that. Um, and it responds to a question, how can I do such and such, um, with a series of actions, but only actions without any attempt to explain or, or, or teach and so on. And it's really important to understand that the question how, if your how-to guide is answering a question, you know, how do I do such and such, then that's often going to be a question that a real beginner couldn't even have formulated in the first place. And that's one of the differences between, um, main differences between a tutorial and a how-to guide in that the tutorial is determined, is led by you, the teacher, who knows exactly where it's going to end up. Whereas the how-to guide is answering a question um, posed by somebody who already has some understanding and knows where they want to go. Um, so it's, it's following the, the uh, the lead of, of the user in this case. Um, reference um, guides 
are also very simple. They're just simply technical descriptions of the machinery and the way it works. There's one function of reference material to describe in the most complete, correct manner possible. So think about uh, the form that an encyclopedia article takes. Um, what do encyclopedia articles look like? What, what style do they adopt? And I see I've got the French Wikipedia entry here. That's because I gave this talk in really bad French a few, um, a few months ago. Uh, I have to change that back. Um, now, let me just, sorry, one of my machines here is just disconnected, but I'm assuming I'm still actually connected and you're still hearing me. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yep. Um, so reference material is information oriented. It's technical description. And whereas tutorials and how to guides are there to answer the needs of the reader, technical references only obligation is to the facts, to the machinery. And it needs to be completely free of distractions from this purpose. It needs to be pretty austere and uncompromising. It's just governed by principles of neutrality, objectivity, factuality. And it can be structured according to the structure and architecture of the machinery itself. So for example, um, if you're uh, writing um, a, a reference guide to something, you can actually use the structure of the code itself as a guide for the way you're structuring your reference material. That makes perfect sense uh, because they can share the same kind of architecture. And finally, the fourth mode of uh, documentation, reference uh, explanation material. This is discussion, the background that illuminates and clarifies some topic. And what it does, it stands back, it opens up uh, the subject, it adopts um, a wider view of it. So you can think of uh, a book that's concerned with the science or the art or the history, the cultural significance of food and cooking and eating. It's not a book of recipes. Uh, it's not a book of technical information uh, about foodstuffs. It's not a book that teaches skills. It's at a completely different um, level of explanation. And um, in English and French and Italian, I don't know what other languages, the word explanation is, is very interesting. It's concerned with unfolding or spreading out. And that's what explanation is. It uncovers things that might have been obscured in the folds of of the matter. Um, this is a good book, by the way, recommended. Um, so it's explanation is understanding oriented. It's a discussion. It does things like it offers context. It establishes connections, maybe towards the past, towards other things, towards uh, alternatives that maybe haven't aren't, aren't present. Um, it answers to the needs of the person who just wants to know more, who wants to build an understanding. And it deepens the theoretical understanding of a practical craft. So its style is discursive and it can go where tutorials and how-to guides and reference are forbidden to tread. It can go into the, this bigger picture of choices and alternatives, into asking why and, and seeking reasons and justifications for things. So this is these are the four components, and I think this is kind of clear and, and beautiful. I think this is the structure that technical documentation should have, should explicitly adopt. Um, but unfortunately, sadly, this is what most documentation actually um, looks like. And this isn't the fault of documentation authors. The fact is that there's a kind of internal gravity that pulls all these things together, a fatal attraction. And the disorder and confusion is because of the tension that's inherent in the structure. What I mean is this, here are, here are the, the, the four modes, and we can see that tutorials and how-to guides um, are similar in that they're both concerned with describing practical steps, while how-to guides and reference are what we need when we're actually at work. Reference Reference and explanation are concerned with theoretical knowledge and tutorials and uh, explanations have the affinity, uh, have an affinity because both serve our study. So 
of there's this kind of natural total collapse of the structure when this is what it should um, look like and I think experience has proved that this does make it easier to write and maintain documentation and make it easier to find one's uh, way around in it. Adopting this doesn't write your documentation for you, but it will give you a much clearer idea of what to write, how to write and where to write it. And it makes it easier for users to understand what it is that they're reading and what what their reading is trying to um, trying to tell them. So that, in a nutshell, is the scheme and um, uh, why it has that um, structure. I just want to give you one more um, example of it. So this is um, here we have the lesson, the tutorial, the pedagogical experience, always safely in the hands of the teacher. Um, the instructor. Then um, how to guides, the recipe for the skilled practitioner, in this case in the form of checklist here for flight operations, but it could just equally be for say deployment or for building a certain kind of um, uh, a certain kind of construct using a certain tool. We have reference, which is the neutral information that's required in order to work. Here it's cartographic information. Um, and then finally explanation, which is there to uh, the discussion that deepens the understanding. This one is an explanation of what lies behind the behavior of an aerodynamic system. And what's present and absent in each case conforms with the, the model of documentation. Um, so things like the um, the checklist and the the map they require competence in order to make sense of the map doesn't include anything that tells you that teaches you how to understand the map that's something that you must have learnt in your tutorial in order that you can use it a and so on so there are four different needs being served by these four different uh, forms or types of documentation. So this is it. This is the um, the synoptic picture of the system. Feel free to take a screenshot of that, but of course I can sh I'll, sh I'll share that in, in, in the channel um, for you anyway. And if you want to read more about it, just have a look at documentation.dvo.com. So I'm, I've spoken for about 20 minutes. Um, if you like, I can answer any questions about that or go into it more deeply. Um, if people would like, I also have some interactive exercises which have proved quite useful, which I did before, but I'm, I'm, um, I know you have your own agenda for this, so um, I'll just hand over now to the audience and see if anybody would like to um, ask any questions. Thank you very much, Daniela. Do you, uh, when you've been through this before with uh, with other organisations, what's the what's the hardest thing for them to 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 sort? Well, let's assume that people actually buy into this and think it's a good idea and and want to do it. Um, then the hardest thing is the fact that they've got documentation already and they've got to rewrite the damn stuff. And that's that's a very difficult experience. Um, and it's difficult because in one sense, it's, it's not really going to work until it's all done but you still have to find a way to make incremental improvements to get there. You can't, if you try and do it all in one go, that would be a big mistake. That's not going to, to work. So the trick is to find ways to work incrementally with what you have to keep it evolving and then continually push it into this shape bit by bit and live with the fact that it's going to be imperfect for quite a long time. I suppose like 
getting it all into this shape is is sort of what we're hoping to do in the next two days but maybe maybe that's too ambitious that sounds quite that sounds quite ambitious um but maybe it's not impossible i'd be interested to see if you can 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 do that yeah um i don't know if you how how closely you looked at the existing wagtail docs i think we have content that fits into all of those all four categories yes um you've got i, I refreshed myself with it um the other night so you've got a pretty good tutorial and then you've got um sort of how to guides and advanced how to guides and i don't think any of that stuff needs to go to be split out in tutorials but i'm i think there is a certain amount of it that uh should be hived off into background explanation conceptual topic material and there's probably some reference material in there that could be taken out and pinned down in a different format as well daniel would you advise to have um sections in the documentations uh with the exact labels like the the four categories yes i would and um for the first time actually yesterday or, or the day before yesterday i saw that um if you look at the gatsby documentation they even went further so i'll, I'll share this in the is everybody in the slack chat no i'll share it in the zoom slack because then everyone so um, how do I share it? Same chat to everyone. So this is, I hadn't seen this before. This is the Gatsby documentation. And they also say, um, refer to what the user might be trying to do or what the user might be needing when they're listing the different sections. So they say how to guides most useful when you're trying to get something done. And I think that's a really good idea because it makes it even more explicit. It, it's um, that that's I hadn't uh, hadn't occurred to me to do that, but that sounds really right. That it's really putting themselves in the shoes of the reader, so the reader can think, oh, I, I'm, I want to do, I'm, you know, I want to learn, or I want to know more, or I want to understand more, and and. That's that seems really good, but yes, I really like this, and I'm I'm in favour of doing this on in our talks. Yeah, um, so I, if you look at the another example would be um, uh, Devio's own uh, docs.devio.com, as distinct distinguished from documentation.devio.com. You'll see that we have the four sections and uh, and and explicitly uh, listed there. Um, but I think the, the, the way Gatsby does it is even even better. So yeah, I think it's really important to make that um, explicit so people can more easily find what it is that they that they need. Tobias has his hand up. Yeah, I have a question which is kind of I guess an outsider perspective, uh, and it's actually two questions, but I think they are related or more or less the same. But saying you're starting from scratch which of the four categories would you say is most important to write first and then the second question which i think is related is in what order should a user read these sections so how is the process of working through them and is it related to the process of writing them that's a good question so um generally if you're starting a new uh documentation set for a project you might start with the readme and what I will do in my README is I will actually write out the f I'll write out four headings. So I've got them in front of me, even in the README. And uh, th the first thing that I will, will say is, you know, what this thing is and, and, and what it's for. That, that's not really part of the documentation. That's just the cover of the book so that you can instantly see whether this is something you want to spend time on or not. Or not. And then I... I'm not obliged to have a finished set of documentation right from the start. So um, I will think if, if I, I imagine somebody seeing this for the very first time 
what can I give them that would be the most useful starting point? And often it will be a very basic how-to guide. And it might be just five or six bullet points, you know, download this, install that, run this command, um, that's it. So often a how-to guide would be a starting point. And then I will just delete the other headings thinking, okay, th those will have to come later. But right now I've written something. I know what that something is. I know it's a how-to guide and it already gives me the, um, the picture in which I can see what's missing. So I might think, okay, this is, I just don't have the time right now to write a proper, proper tutorial for the beginner, but maybe my code is so simple that I'm going to just target this at the experienced uh, audience. I will assume that somebody who sees this, who's interested, will see the brief statement about what it does, will see the how-to guide, and then will go and look at the code, for example, if they want to pick out the reference, because it might be simple enough. If I want beginners to be able to use this, then I'm going to have to eventually write my tutorial and so on. But I just keep coming back to it in, in, in this cycle. And the temptation always is to write what you know, to write what's in your mind. And that's the temptation to avoid because you, what you have to think about is, imagine somebody coming and seeing this. If you could give them one thing that would help them, what would that one thing be now? And it's going to be unfinished. But that's okay. You can always add more to it. But it means that at every single step, you will always be adding something of value. And you will always be adding something of value to the potential user or adopter or customer. Um, and what you want to get out of your head onto the page is not relevant at all. You can save that in your private notes. Um, and does, oh, and then your other question was about, it's kind of a cycle. So, um, the tutorial is, is the point at which in the kitchen with the child, the tutorial, uh, we're going to make something in the kitchen. The only thing that I want to come out of that is that the child will say, can we do it again another time? That's the only thing. That's the only outcome I need. I don't need them to be able to repeat it. I just want to give them the confidence that they're in good hands and the belief that they're going to achieve something if they stick at it. So um, the tutorial is the way I'm going to invite people in and gain their, their trust. And then very quickly, actually, well, depending on their confidence, they, they will start to move through the other things you know because people generally use software because they want to do something so they'll start looking at the how-to guide and maybe they don't even need your tutorial if they're competent enough but you can think of it as uh if, if you look at the um you know the distinction between the practical steps and the theoretical knowledge and the parts that are for your study and the parts that are for when you're actually at work trying to do something that's um, that's also a, a useful way of understanding the cycle. Oh, sorry, lots of people have. Hands yeah, thanks. Up. That was a, a good answer. I'm still muted. <laughs> I had a question about uh, the vector documentation. We probably have a lot of content that mixes uh, the four quadrants, and. Um, yeah, what do you suggest that we, how to approach that? Would would that be for, or like two separate documents or what, what do you do with content that mixes the... Yeah, um, splitting, uh, splitting things up. Um, so you'll often see in a single document, after a while you, you get, you start reading things, you think, oh, okay, this, this part is, uh, you know, it might be describing some functionality and you and you look at a part and think that's very interesting but right now i see in the middle of the how-to guide a chunk of reference material and then that's very easy just to put into the reference material related to that uh functionality so that's a simple copy and paste operation 
um, or, or, or maybe in the reference material you'll see something that goes into this digressions and you think oh okay that's it, it's uh, at this point it stopped being reference and it started being a, a discussion a conceptual level uh, explanation yeah sh should we uh, cross-reference that then or all like the all the time see also yes thank you uh, hi so um I'm having problems uh, separating how to guides and reference. Like for instance, quite often you see um, like an API reference, they have examples that kind of end up being a bit of a how to, you know, like how to use this. And so I don't know at which point we should move that to somewhere else. That's a good question. And I'm gonna answer that if, uh, you don't mind with by showing you an actual example um, if I can find my share screen button again uh, here we are so this is our uh, the DVO developer handbook so in the how-to guides uh, we have how to use the DVO API okay and this shows you some basic things that you can do step by step in order to use the API but the API documentation is, looks like this. It's actually, this is actually generated by Open API itself. And this is what the reference um, documentation looks like. This is what I mean. It's completely austere. It's uncompromising. There's no explanation. There's nothing, nothing in here tells you how to use it. If you didn't already understand what this, meant in general, this would be completely useless uh, to you. Um, but um, if we go back, the how-to guide, I could probably expand this with some examples and so on, but I will not want to try and repeat anything that's in the reference documentation. Also because that reference documentation um, is quite unusual in, in that it can be generated automatically. And that's really nice because that's one job I will never have to do again to write out any reference. It's going to be somebody else's problem. So um, that's how I see the difference. Does that, I don't know if, I hope that answers or helps answer your, your question a bit. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what what happens in the event that somebody, I mean, th this happens to me a lot with the Django documentation that I arrive there from a Google or DuckDuckGo search result, and then suddenly I'm, I'm lost in the reference area. Do you have any approaches for signposting people to say, no, you've come to the wrong place. You need to be looking at. Um, as Kuhn said, hyperlinks are really valuable and, um, uh, I'll often think, you know, in the, in the reference guide, I might have um, a mention of some functionality and and the the parameters parameters you have to use with a certain function, and I'll say, okay, if, if um, uh, this is also discussed in our tutorial, see page such and such of the tutorial, or or um, see the how to guide on creating forms or or whatever it is. So I think links will, will get you out of that. Um, but also, the Django documentation is quite interesting because although Django's documentation has this same structure, it's not adhered to as strongly as it should be. So um, if you look at the Django tutorial, for example, it's full of really baffling explanation to the beginner who just wants to um, get get started and I think that should be moved out. If you look at the Django logging documentation, it's three different kinds of things crammed in into one and those are things that need to be um, improved. Um, but signposting is is the way to do it. So when it comes to the separating out these strands, I think for me 
possibly the biggest uh, mental sort of hurdle I have is leaving out the explanation from the other sections. I think my instinct, if I'm sort of showing someone how to do someone, it would be say, this is the code you need to write, this is the result you'll see, and this is what's going on. And I was wondering, if, is there, are there any sort of good patterns of identifying when you're kind of going too far on the elaboration and when that should be sort of moved yeah. out? Yeah. As soon as you start enjoying yourself, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> okay, that's um, and that also goes for coding. Um, so as soon as you start to have fun writing, then something else has taken over. It's you're writing now for your pleasure rather than for the audience's pain, and that's the danger sign for me. Um, I mean, it happens with me the same. Also, when, I, when I'm when I'm talking, when I start to really like the sound of what I'm saying, then I suddenly realise I'm getting carried away by the sound of my own voice and have to pull back and um, stop thinking about. This is what I, I, I said earlier. Stop thinking about what I want to say and what my audience needs. And uh, it's. I think it's very easy to see that in a tutorial when you think about doing something with a small child and you think, you know, this is so fascinating the way proteins coagulate or something like that. But come on, you can save that for another time, but not when you're teaching them how to boil an egg or, or, or yeah. something. It, 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 will, it will just get in the, in the way. And um, or if, if you like, if you like the aviation related example, just imagine somebody uh, doing a um, trying to execute a a, 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 a a landing in tricky visual conditions they want the checklist of exactly the things that they need to do in the right order the last thing they need is some kind of explanation of uh, instrument flight rules at that point or or, or the underlying technology um, but you can put the links in to the other stuff yeah let me yeah, make all sense. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess it's me again. Um, so I wanted to ask about the how you ensure documentation is up to date because for reference documentation it happens more or less automatically because whenever you change something in a project with the code you will just change the reference docs which there they're right next to the code right before uh, the more I guess you, you won't keep the tutorial and the how to guides next to your code, right? So how do you ensure uh, that they are always up to date? And yeah. especially I'm thinking in uh, when we're talking about like internal codes and uh, internal tooling, where you don't have a need to uh, feed external users. So it doesn't really drive the main value of your product, but you need to onboard new developers and stuff like that. I know this is maybe a bit on the side for Wagtail, but I hope it's, uh, I think it's an interesting question nonetheless. Yeah. So the, the first question, um, in the case of Wagtail, the documentation is part of the code base. So the answer there is to ensure that any functionality changes that are committed also come with the requisite documentation changes, just as they must come with the tests. Um, so that's quite easy when, you, when you're dealing with a project where the code is part of the, uh, sorry, the, the documentation is part of the code base, then, you know, the, the documentation can be versioned as well as, as the code. Um, it's not always the case that uh, reference material is all auto-generated. Some of it can be if you're lucky, but you still need a human being to write good reference uh, material. It's not just a case of uh, pumping out um, auto-documented uh, strings and, and, and things um, like that. So th that's one thing to be aware of. So uh, again, if I share this for an example here in, in, in um, my... Is that the right page I'm sharing? Um, yeah, in in, in the technical reference, there are things that need to be written out by hand. It's not enough to rely on uh, auto-documentation there. 
Um, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of lost track of your second question. Uh, yeah, so, um, well, I guess my, my main point is that when, if you take the case of Java docs, for example, or Python doc strings, right, you have them right next to the function you're trying to document, and it's very easy for the developer to see that this needs to be kept up to date with what this function does, right? But when you're, the moment you're taking the step up, right, to, ref, uh, to try to write reference documentation for how a system is built, or when you start uh, looking into the explanations for the whole system, it's much harder to, at least from a developer perspective, to see the link between the code you're changing and the necessary changes to the documentation, right? Yep. Um, I think that um, it's really, one thing that's really valuable is to close the loop with the users. So uh, some, uh, somebody here from Torchbox said she, she was just lurking and Tom said well no you should try it. maybe you can write a you can contribute something and I think that's really valuable because that perspective from the outside looking in is the perspective that you need for all of the documentation even the reference material uh, of course it has to reflect the internals but the perspective has to be the perspective of the user, of the reader who's going to use it. And if that holds true for things like um, reference material, it holds, it, it, it's even truer for things like tutorials and how-to guides. So the most valuable thing that you can have if you're trying to write a, a tutorial is to have somebody who hasn't done the tutorial who doesn't know it yet and to sit with that person and find out what their experience is this is really difficult in tutorials because if you're an actual teacher if you're actually in the kitchen with your child then you say oh no let me adjust your hand on the knife or no that if you put that there this is going to happen and you can't be there in a tutorial with someone so you have to take every chance you can get to have that feedback and and to just understand the experience of, of the of the reader. Um, I, Ollie oh. asked a question in in the okay. chat and had been waiting patiently, so I thought I'd address that if that's okay about uh, uh, writing style to make sure all the writers are writing the same. And is there a cheat sheet? I don't know. I, I think you can kind of develop a house style. Um, and in an open source project where you're inviting contributions from people potentially from all over the world, from different cultures whose uh, native language is not necessarily the language of the documentation, that's something that uh, a documentation editor can help clear up afterwards often. Um, I think having built-in spelling checking is very valuable. Um, I think that in a tutorial it makes a lot of sense to be relaxed in the kind of language you're using. You can say, um, don't worry about this. In the next section, we are, we're we going to do that. So you can use informal contractions as you would in, in speech. You can use the, 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 um, the first person plural. You can say, we're going to do this. In a how-to guide, I would tend to say, do this, do that, now do this, now do that. So that's very... Uh, it's just a series of imperatives. In uh, a reference guide, I would tend less to say don't or won't. I'll say do not do this. This will expose the database credentials or, or, or something, you know, and, and be very uh, bold, uh, flat and bold about it. So, yeah, um, I think style isn't the most crucial thing people tend to worry about that especially in corporations but in an open source project then i think it, it will acquire its own friendly character and, and that's the most in many ways the most valuable part of a style thanks Phil? any other um 
I don't know, we didn't decide how much time there will be for questions. So I hope you're still okay to take on so many. It's definitely very valuable to us. And uh, I, I'm, I'm happy, but uh, you tell me that I, I'm, I'm, I'm at your disposal. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll ask a couple more then. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you what you thought there'll be a, a place for video in documentation for things like tutorials, and also the place you see for material that's from the community. So community tutorials, community how to's, there's lots of these. Should we try and incorporate them into our documentation, the official one? Or is it good to have this be separate? Um, I absolutely hate making videos because it takes me hours and hours. And then no sooner have I finished it, then they're out of date. And the tiniest thing needs to change in an interface or an API and the whole video needs to be done Again, a change that I could change in a few moments in text has to be redone. So some people really like making them and really like using them. I'm not saying that they're, they're not good. I'm just saying that I, I don't like doing them at all. And I find, them, I find that they make a lot of work for myself. So if that's the same experience you have, then perhaps don't make work for yourself by putting them for example in tutorials but people love making these things and they're very popular and people like to share them so by all means encourage people to do that whether they're going to be of the quality and maintained kept up to date in the way that you need is a different question so i would only bring something in if you're sure that in six months time it's not going to be misleading um, as for community contributions i think the they kind of run run alongside because uh one of the reasons that people do their own how-to videos of things is, is partly because they're filled with the excitement of having learned it and wanting to share it and also the experience of expressing how to do something is part of their own learning process. So you'll often get these things from people who have just learned something. And it's the way of confirming to themselves and other people that, that yeah, this really works. I can, I can do it, I can repeat it, I can share it and say it. So they're, they're very valuable. Whether you want to informally bring them into the documentation or not, I think that uh, you'd have to be quite careful about that. Um, but definitely try to encourage them if you can on the part of other people. I have a question around uh, linking and, and what if you have any tips on kind of how to stay people's hands when they're doing that, because I, while you were talking, I thought I might just as well teach myself how to use Gatsby. So I went through the first couple of pages and what I noticed was, um, although the language was very simple, it was saying, oh, you might also need to do this, by the way. And um, in the kind of debugging, it said running a site in Gatsby will set up a server locally that enables features like hot module replacement, which is hyperlinked. So I thought, oh, I better just click that and check what that is. And obviously it's not quite written for me, but that's a problem I have in, in other worlds when I'm looking at how-to guides is sometimes getting feeling like I need to holistically know all of the things that are being linked to. So I wondered if you had any best practices between striking that balance between having a, a kind of holistic documentation that hyperlinks and that's excellent, but also getting me to the end of the task before I've got nine tabs open and I'm stressed. Um, in, in the how-to guides, I think that's perfectly fine. And I think that it's right to have all those things open because in a how-to guide, you're assuming an already competent user who can who has some inkling of what a hot module might be and in a how-to guide it's also okay to say if you want to do this then you need to do that or if you're running on version pre 3.8 then you'll need to consider this question and that's okay in a how-to guide in a tutorial you you don't i say here's moses again in a tutorial you don't give anybody any choices whatsoever you know, not, not even the color, just if, if you want it to be, if you want it to look pink, you give them the CSS, uh, you know, the, the color code for pink, because you don't want any choice on the part of the, uh, any decision making on the part of the user to interrupt the learning process. They, they, they're going to follow your steps until they come to a successful conclusion. And you can say, you can read more about this over here, but 
don't tell them in the tutorial, oh, by the way, if you wanted to um, uh, reverse the flow of, 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 of this data gathering operation, then consider this. That, that doesn't belong in a, in, a, in a tutorial because the tutorial is following your lesson plan. That would be like the, uh, the flight instructor saying, well, you know, how would you like to how would you like to approach your first landing? And it doesn't work in aviation and it won't work in, in other spheres either. We have uh, four types of uh, information delivery. Is, is there also a fifth or other things that don't fit in the categories? Um, well, um, I wouldn't call this information delivery. I think I think that's the first. I think that's really imp important because um, I, I definitely wouldn't. I don't think a tutorial has anything to do with information, for example. So, but but still, uh, you ask the question: Are there other categories? Well, um, yes, and if. Uh, you have real-world documentation, you're going to have things like a home page or an introduction telling you what it is. And that's not one of these four things. Um, you might have your release notes. Now, your release notes, it's up to you. They could be part of the reference. Or if the release notes are upgrade notes, upgrade notes, how to upgrade to the next version, then you might decide they belong in how-to guides. So you've always got how-to guides, how to upgrade from version X to version Y. Um, a contribution guide. Now, you might have, you might decide that you're going to write how to contribute, or you might decide, in which case it would be a how-to guide, or it might be about contributing to Wagtail, in which case it could be a whole section in the explanation part, or, you could decide that you're going to make contribution um, a separate section apart from all these four. So th that that's the reality that um, if you try and um, make every single thing that you might write down in the documentation fit into this scheme, it, it's not quite like that. Um, uh, things like the uh, the introduction, the contribution guide, the release notes, you'll have to make some decisions about where they belong. Um, but you can still think about these questions. What is the need of the user right now? Do I want, and you can answer those needs in different ways. Do I want to, uh, do I want to uh, write my contribution section as a how-to guide? You know, do I want to tell people how to make a pull request? Or do I just want to give a description of how we do it around here? Yes, thank you. So um, if I call them types of delivery, information delivery, uh, how would we call the four sections or what? I would call them forms or modes of documentation or components. For components of documentation. Something like that, yeah. Cool. Um, there was a question from LB Johnston. I'm sorry, I don't know your uh, your name. Not sure if it's been asked, but does Wagtail's user-facing documentation fit in, i.e. non-developer users of the Wagtail CMS? And that's a really good question. Um, I tried to do this for Django CMS, and it was a failed experiment. And the reason it was a failed experiment is that every actual user's um, setup of Django CMS is completely different. It would be like trying to have, almost like trying to have a user guide, a user facing guide for Django, because every Django, apart from not, no Django site is the same. Even even the admin might not be present there. So that's really difficult. If the product always has a, a fundamental basic experience that every user can be expected to face then yes, I think it's worth building user facing. I'm talking about user rather than developer, user facing documentation uh, into the documentation set. 
but my own attempt to do it wasn't very successful because the product in practice will look so different for real world um, users. Does that answer the question? I hope so. Um, yeah, that's great. I think it's a difficult and nuanced thing by the sounds of it. It's not easy. And I think, um, yeah, that makes sense. I think it's a really interesting question for us. We have, so we do have some, we call it an editor guide in the Wagtail docs. Um, and I think it works reasonably well. And because there probably is enough that's consistent about Wagtail instances that, that means that it can be useful, but I'm not sure if it's the right place for that guide. And, and, but I don't know how many Wagtail editors are aware of it because they probably see it as being part of this other sort of technical documentation that they don't need to look at. So we should perhaps consider moving it into, for example, into wagtail.io or, or I don't know, including it in Wagtail itself, something like that. I think the most valuable- Yeah, I've always- oh, Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I've always thought, yeah, it would make sense almost like a module, you know how we have the style guide module that can be added inside Wagtail. Something you know like that would be a a way, but anyway, that's probably out of the scope of this sprint. <laughs> um, I would like to find out how many people actually use it. So again, don't think so much about the information or, or or the instruction it contains, but about whether there really is a need for it, whether anybody wants this. So again, to pose the question from the perspective of the user. To fight before, otherwise you yeah, could be spending a lot of effort on something that actually nobody really needs, or it might be really valuable. You just don't know. I had a sort of follow-on question to that, Daniel. Is it, do you find that there are some areas of the documentation, to do at least, that that are used a lot, and some areas that aren't used at all? I mean, I wonder if we wrote extensive explanation documents. You know, perhaps they might just not be used or something like that. Is there is that something you've assessed? Yeah, um, that, that's that's a really good question. Um, so at Divio, I have oversight of technical support. So there's this, and I'm also involved in engineering. So there's this loop that involves the product, the documentation and technical support, and they can feed back into each other very fast. And I know which parts of the documentation are very heavily used because they are things that we send people to from technical support, sometimes multiple times a day, because they're just very common questions. Then there are other parts that maybe somebody will read once a month when they're thinking, hmm, now I wonder if I can do such and such, or if it would be suitable to do such and such. And there's no harm in keeping that stuff in there, as long as it's reasonably refreshed and doesn't get forgotten. Because something that's only used once a month can still be as life-saving as something that's used every day. And the mere fact of writing things out crystallizes concepts, particularly, you're talking about explanation. So that can be really useful as setting down some thoughts on what people ought to be doing and, and thinking about. Um, do you do you use analytics to see what sections people actually do read more of? Because that can be very useful to see. Yeah, I don't know if we have. Uh, that's what I was yeah wondering about really. But yeah, yeah. that's we should. We we don't, but we should. Yeah, I think well, that's something maybe you could help us with. Sure. Yep. Well, you've still got your hand up. Have you got a question? Oh, no, that was it. Sorry. All right. I was just checking myself as well whether we had this in our analytics accounts, but I, I'll confirm that later. Um, Any one last question? I think Daniel has already answered a lot and he will hopefully be around a bit more during the sprints, but any other takers? All right, I'll take that as a no. Thank you, Daniele. It's amazing for us to have you here. Uh, definitely the best introduction we could ever wish for for this sprint and I think puts us in the very best mindset for this.